Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, Revelation in chapter number two. Revelation and chapter number two. We've been going through the seven churches of Revelation where these are seven literal historical churches that the Lord Jesus Christ had a personal letter sent to them. Remember that Jesus Christ told the Apostle John, write these things down. The Apostle John wrote those things down as commanded to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then John sent those letters to the first church, the church of Ephesus. There, the church of Ephesus wrote and copied the letter for themselves and sent the letter to the next town of Smyrna. There at Smyrna, they would write a copy of the letter for themselves. Then they would send the letter to the next church of Pergamos, where they would write a letter for themselves and send it next to the next one. With this, we see a great example of inspiration and preservation. That God inspired his word, that John wrote down exactly what Jesus wanted. Then the people preserved his word by making copies and writing exactly what the scriptures said and having a preserved copy down. And we're thankful we have this picture. But the important part that we're placing is that Jesus himself wrote a letter. This was not a letter by Paul or a letter by Peter or a letter by John. This was a letter by Jesus himself who owns the churches, who has every right to do with what is his. And he is examining these churches by saying, I know something about you. I know what you're going through. And this is what you need to fix. We now come to the third church, the church of Pergamos. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 and notice with me in verse number 12. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12, the Bible says this, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. And the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark the important phrase that is covering the church of Pergamos found in Revelation 2 and verse 14? Revelation 2 and verse 14, notice the phrase, the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. And as we address this church of Pergamos, we could see this great emphasis here, the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. If you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. 
And as we come to you now, we're just asking that you would just give us grace, that you would give us mercy, that you would give us understanding as we examine this church, that we could learn from it and that we could be warned from it. Again, you guide and direct. Help us to see you high, holy, and lifted up. Help us to examine ourselves and draw close to you and that we would take heed to your warning. Fill me with your spirit because I know it's not by my power, not by my might, but it is by your spirit, saith the Lord, that we could trust you to do your own work. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with energy. Fill me with grace to get your work accomplished that I could be a good vessel for you. In your name we pray. Amen. As we examine this church, there are a couple things that we want to point out. The very first thing is that the faithful Christians in the church, the faithful Christians in the church. Notice with me again in verse 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos. Now, as a reminder, who is this angel? Well, God had already defined it earlier in chapter number one, that the angel is the uh, the pastor, the messenger of the church. And so remember that this is being addressed to the pastor and the pastor is supposed to read this word and explain it and apply the word and encourage people to respond unto the Lord. So again, it's addressed to the pastor. The pastor's responsibility is to share it to the church folks. And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, these things saith he that hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now notice, it all begins with God. It all ends with God. God is the goal. This church begins with God. He says, let me start off by telling you who's telling you this. I'm the guy, Jesus is, I'm the God, the guy, the, the, the responsible one who hath the sharp sword with two edges. This is the one who's telling you this. What is this? What is this speaking about? Christ is the one with a sharp sword. Now the sharp sword here is a battle sword. This battle sword would be a sword that would be so big you would actually carry it on a shoulder. So it's not something that you would sheath and then carry around. But it would be a big battle sword that you would carry over your shoulder when you're not swinging it because it's too big to hang anywhere else. It is a big battle sword. What is this sword, by the way? The Bible makes reference of a different sword in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 where it says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now the sword that's being referred to in Hebrews 412 is actually a dagger that you would sheath. This is a dagger that you could pull out quickly. It's a dagger that you could stab someone in the heart with. It's a dagger that could do minute work. Does that make sense? And maybe you could even think of it this way, that the word of God in Hebrews 412 is carrying the idea that it's a scalpel. If someone had cancer, you only want to cut out the bad flesh without doing any damage or as little damage as possible to the healthy flesh. Does that make sense? So this sword in Hebrews 4.12 is a surgical tool. It's a small tool. It's pictured as a small dagger, but something that you would get something accomplished. The sword that's being referenced in the book of Revelation is a broad sword, a heavy sword. It's a sword that you would use for destroying. Not for surgery, but for destroying. You don't want to do surgery with a big broadsword. Could you imagine a doctor coming in and having a big old sword and he's like carrying on his shoulder and he could barely hold it and says, all right, let's get this out. All right, so it's not used for surgical strikes. It's used for a quick destroy. It's got heavy to it. It's got a sharpness to it. So Jesus is saying, let me tell you the one that's telling you this. The one who has a destroying sword who could just wipe it out right now. Not surgical, but complete destruction. He's the one that's telling you this. The one that's able to do the destroying. To destroy with one heavy blow. Now, both of these pictures, by the way, are the word of God. God's word can do its own work. And that Jesus, of course, prefers in our life to have the surgical strike. 
Let's just get out the sin. Let's just get out the problem and leave as much healthy flesh that's left over. Let's do that. However, when there's disobedience, when it comes to the place where they refuse to obey, then that's when the broadsword comes out. That's able to do a destruction. Now, this should be frightening. Jesus with a scalpel is a help. Jesus with a broadsword is frightening. Because it means we're in trouble. It means we've come to the place where that's it. So again, I want you to imagine because it all begins with our vision of God. If Jesus with a big destroying sword on his shoulder is standing there saying, fix this or else, um, that's something that should pay attention to. This is something that should get your attention. This is something that he is taking very seriously. And so when we start off, we could see that Jesus is going to address a very serious subject. And when he's addressing this, it's not, well, I kind of hope that you'd think about getting this fixed. It's, you better get this fixed now. This is something dangerous that the solution is not surgery, it's destruction. Now again, he's not speaking to the lost church. He's speaking to the church of Pergamos. His church. It's made up a group of baptized believers voluntarily gathering themselves together for the purpose of accomplishing the Great Commission. God's work can do it. Notice if you don't mind. In verse number 13. I know thy works. Now that's both a comforting thing and a frightening thing. I know what you do and I know what you don't do. I know everything you do. And where thou dwellest. He knows I know where you live. I know what you have to face. I know the people that's around you. But notice this. Even where Satan's seat is. Now this is interesting. Where does this church dwell? Where does this church serve at? It's a place where Satan has a seat. The idea of a seat carries two different meanings. Both of them apply. The first one is a seat almost like a place where you physically sit. It's where my seat is. It's where I'm at. It's where I dwell. It's where I live at. So at home, you probably have your favorite chair. That's where your seat is. And you sit there so that way you can relax. It's where you dwell at. You feel comfortable because that's where you're at. You know where this church was at? A, a place where Satan made home. Now, may I remind you that Satan is not God. That means he doesn't have God's powers or abilities. God is omniscient, means he knows everything. Do you know Satan doesn't know everything? God can be everywhere at once. Satan can not. That's why he has to have a dwelling place because Satan can only be at one place at once. Now that's comforting. But to this church, how would you like to have it where Satan has his house in your neighborhood? And you're trying to have a church in his neighborhood. Do you think that's an easy place to have a church? Not at all. Knocking on doors, you have Satan's neighbors. Satan has a great influence here. It is not a place that is easy to serve. But notice the idea of seat also has a different meaning that also applies. Not only is it the place where Satan dwells, but the idea of seat also carries the idea like a seat of government. A seat of government. And what we have here is that not only does Satan dwell here, but it is also the headquarters of his government. Now, it's one thing to have a church where Satan lives. It's also another thing to have a church trying to grow and follow after God when Satan's in charge of the government where you're at too. Because the government can pass laws. The government can give you a hard time. The government can persecute you. This is not an easy place to go. And you know what? This church hasn't folded. This church has kept going on. It's a hard place to serve and they're serving anyways. That's a blessing. And God says, I see this. 
I see what you do. I see how you work. I see that Satan's there. He's ruling. The government's the ruler. I could see Satan's got his claws in everything. I could see that this is where he makes home. And I see that you still work there. You're still trying to reach people with the gospel. You're still trying to tell people about the Lord, even though it's against you. Now, it's interesting that when a government rules, what happens is that they rule over the people instead of serve the people. That's always been a big theory of government. The idea of true government should be the idea where they serve the people. But this is not that. This is where the government rules over the people. And so it is oppressive. It is difficult. These Christians yet were still willing to stand. Notice again verse 13. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name. How would you like to be in Satan's neighborhood and still call yourself a Christian? Do you think it would be very easy to kind of say, nope, I don't know what you're talking about. They still held fast Jesus' name. They were still not ashamed of Jesus, even though they're living in Satan's neighborhood. Not only that, but notice verse 13. Thou was not denied my faith. Not only has they not denied Jesus' name, but they haven't denied the faith. They're still pressing forward. They're still trying to make ground. So much so, even in those days where Antipas, one of their church members, was slain among you where Satan dwellest. He goes, I know how hard it is that you have people of your church that have been persecuted and killed. That was a member of your church for going out and witnessing, for being faithful to my name. And you're still doing it anyways. Now again, it's one thing to do it. It's another thing than one of your church members get killed and you still do it. That is some faithful Christians to be able to still meet together in church when the government says don't. To still meet together and have a Bible when the, Bi- the government says you can't have a Bible. To still meet when they're actually killing church members and say I'm still going to show up to church even though the threat of death. That is a commendable church. It's a difficult ground but they're still being faithful. Imagine How many people would be faithful under those conditions today? The threat, if you go to church, will kill you. Like, okay, well, I'm just not going to church. I got YouTube. Government tells you you can't show up to church no more. Okay, no problem. We'll do something else. I mean, the government will never tell anyone not to go to church, will they? You see this was a big deal that they were still going to be faithful even if they were threatened. Even with the government oppressing and even with the government killing them. They were still going to be faithful to God's name and keep the faith. These were some Christians in the church that were trying to do what's right. But then we come to the word but. We see a second thing. The false creeds in the church The false creeds in the church. Now, this is a church that's trying to do what's right. They're trying to press forward. But then something happened. Notice, if you don't mind, in verse 14, we see Jesus, who is the head of the church, who's the one writing the letter. He's the one who addresses there's a problem. Verse 14. But, but, I have a few things against thee. Number one. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed to idols. To commit fornication. Now what's going on? Well we know that there's persecution going on actively. And one of the things that is a great temptation to do. Is to get to the place where we're no longer being persecuted. Now, the government's not going to change. The people aren't going to change. So what has to change by default? The church. 
So the church, in order to get less persecution, start changing what they believe, start changing the things they do, so that way people don't try to come after them. They're less offensive to the world, less offensive to the government. They try to compromise on what they believe, so they don't receive persecution. Now, what God does is he goes back and uses an Old Testament illustration that happened 1,700 years before this event. He goes all the way back to the past and says, let's pull up some Bible history. He says, let me take you to the story of Balaam. Because you have now followed this same thing. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of Balaam, may I tell you the story of Balaam? That is, the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness and they were preparing to get to the promised land. They had to cross a land called Moab. Now, God had no plans on doing anything to Moab. Moab was under God's protection at the time, meaning the idea that he didn't want them to, uh, the the Israelites to declare war on them. They were just going to pass through their territory. Now, Balak, who was the king of Moab, was kind of worried to have two and a half million people wander through his territory. Now, they were just passing through, but he had already heard about the battles that had been won by the other kings who challenged him. And so he was looking. He says, I can't beat them head on. I can't. God's put blessing on them. I've got to figure out something to go on. So King Balak said, you know what? I heard that there's a preacher. That God answers this preacher's prayers I'm going to go send some people out to him and see if he could help me out. So what the king did is he sent some ambassadors, some chief people, and they went over to Balaam's house. Hey, preacher, we hear that God answers your prayers. He says, I do. He says, then if you don't mind, we'd like to borrow you. We'd like for you to come and curse these people that are wandering through here. And Balaam said, you know what? Before I do anything, let me pray. And so he prayed. And God says, don't do it. Don't go with them. Don't do it. And Balaam said to the guys, I'm sorry. I talked to God. God says, I can't go. Sorry. So those messengers go back to Balak and said, he said that he can't come. Balak says, you know what? What we're doing is that we're not offering him enough. We need to get him a better position. We need to get him some better money. In fact, we're going to send higher ranking ambassadors to go. So they went and get higher ranking ambassadors. They got more money to offer him. They got better titles to come. Mr. Balaam, preacher, we hear that God answers your prayers. We want you to pray against these people to curse them. And we were wondering if you could help us out. We're willing to offer you double, triple. We're willing to give you this and give you this. And Balaam, his eyes went cartoonish and went cha-ching and little dollar signs went up there. Now, the problem was, is that God already told him, no. Is God going to change his mind on this issue? No. No. But Balaam really, really, really wanted to go. And so he went to God again in prayer. God, they're offering me a lot of money and I really want to go and I think I could do this. And he talked to God. And the way that he talked to God was not getting to the place where he says, God, what do you want me to do? But he said, God, this is what I want you to do. And I want you to put my blessing on him. And God said, just go. Now, that just go ahead and go is like when your wife looks at you and you say, I want to go fishing. Just go. That means you better not go. You go at your own risk. All right. That's that tone there. It's like when the kids go up and said, mom, can I go to the park? Just go ahead and go. That means you better not go. But like a husband who has hearing problems and any type of child, they go anyways. God told me I can go. That's not what they meant. But that's what they said. I can go. It was, you go at your own risk. There's going to be consequences for it. And so he goes, listen, God said I can go. All right, you guys go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and prepare and I'll meet you there. Okay. And so Balaam begins to go. He's all excited. He's counting money in his head. He's absentmindedly thinking. And uh, God 
puts an angel. So they get to the place where he's riding a donkey and they're riding in a narrow pass. Can't go this way, can't go this way. And God puts an angel right in front of the donkey and the donkey can see him and the donkey doesn't want to go. I mean, this angel's holding a sword. Remember, we just talked about that destroying sword. The donkey went, nope. Well, Balaam doesn't see the angel yet and he starts kicking the donkey. He starts beating the donkey. I want you to go. Why are you stopping? And the donkey says, I can't, and speaks out loud. And Balaam doesn't miss a beat. He starts arguing with the donkey. Now, I don't know uh, what kind of person you'd be, but if your pet started to use words to talk with you, you should probably pause a second and say, there's something going on here. But he gets an argument with the donkey. And the donkey's like, please don't beat me again. There's an angel in front of me. I just can't go. Finally, Balaam looks up and there's the angel with a destroying sword and he goes, oops. <laughs> and God has a message. It's fine, you go ahead and go, but you better not say anything that I don't tell you to say. That was a bad threat. That was, you better listen to me. Again, holding that destroying sword, you better listen to me. You if you're going to go, which you shouldn't go, that was still a kind of warning. Balaam should have just said, you know what? You told me not to. I'm seeing the error of my ways. But you know, we're kind of stubborn that way. He still wants to get paid. You know what he's thinking? He's trying to say, can I obey God and still make the world happy? Can I obey God and still get money? Can I obey the world and st- or God and still let the world be on my side? You can almost see where the doctrine of Balaam is starting to be referred to here in the church of Pergamos. So Balaam gets his warning from God and comes and meets Balak. And he says, all right, Balak, I'm here. I'm trying to help out, but I want to let you know, I can only say the things that God tells me to say. He said, I don't care. Go ahead and let's go. All right, let's go to a mountain. Let's overlook. So they overlook and they see the children of Israel. Remember, we just got through doing the, the, uh, the uh, tabernacle series and we showed you how it was lined up and what he was looking at as he saw the children of Israel light up there. And he says, all right, I've got this. God bless these people. And Balak says, what are you doing? I sent you to curse these people and you bless them. You just made it worse. That's not what I asked you to do. He says, I'm sorry. I can only do what God told me to do. So Balak brings Balaam to another place. He says, let's try this again. All right, you've got this. All right, I got this. I got this. I got this. All right, God, I want you to bless these people. What are you doing? I hired you to curse these people. I can only do what God tells me to do. We're going to try it again. You better get it right this time. Now he's getting threatened by another person. You better get this right. All right, I've got this. Come on, come on, come on. God, I want you to to, to, bless these people. Balak's like, what are you doing to me? He says, listen, I can't. God's already blessed them. I can't curse what God's already blessed. You can almost look at Balak looking at him now saying, all right, that's it for you hired you. You came all this way. You made things worse. (laughs) And he's thinking about getting rid of this guy. And the preacher's like, I still want to get paid. I don't want to be persecuted. I don't want to be killed. How can I make money and not be killed and still be able to not tick off God? How do I do this? And he goes, wait a second, before you do anything rash, I can't curse these people. But what if I told you a way where you can have these people be cursed by their own God and let God destroy them? Balak says, tell me more. He says, what you see is that God told these people that they had to be separated unto him and that they couldn't serve any other God but him. But you, Balak, know the power of ladies. And so why don't you allow your ladies to go down the mountain and go make friends with them? 
let them start dating your ladies. And what will happen is that eventually they'll fall in love and then your ladies can introduce them to your gods. And because they're not serving the God of Israel, then uh, God will curse them because he'll be mad at them. He says, you think this work? He says, I guarantee it. And so that's what they did. We see this recorded in the book of Numbers where the Moabites brought their ladies down, started to have a relationship with many of the men. The men started dating them. The lady said, oh, I don't want to go to church. I know. Let's go do this instead. And instead of worshiping God and going to the house of God and setting aside that time for God, she began to introduce the, to them slowly but surely the ways of the Moabites, which eventually led them to worshiping the gods of the Moabites, the little G gods. And sure enough, God took that broad sword and what put destruction through all of Israel. It's that big broad sword, lots of destruction. And God refers to this incident in a several different ways. What we see is that when Satan can't destroy from the outside, what Satan learned to do is to destroy it from the inside. Let's let God curse them. You see, this works. That's why Satan keeps going back to his old playbook. You see, what he did with the church of Pergamos is that he had the government pass laws and the people said, no, we're going to stay faithful to Christ. Oh, then we're going to put the pressure on the outside. And the church was still faithful. We're going to start killing people. And the church was still faithful. And he says, all right, the outside's not going to work. But you know what? There's something that's always worked. Let's get this church to compromise on doctrine. Let's let them to twist what they believe. Let's let them try to get along with the world and God will put his curse upon this church. Remember, Jesus is standing there with a broad sword ready to swing at this time. Why? Because they've already succumbed to this. So much so that the Bible makes a reference of this. It's such an important story that this concept is brought up three times in the New Testament. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 2, it is referred to as the way of Balaam. The way of Balaam. Meaning that this path has been taken to the church and, and this process that Satan has used over and over, the way of Balaam. In the book of Jude, it's referred to in verse 11 as the error of Balaam. The error of Balaam. And then in the book of Revelation here in chapter number 2, it is brought up as the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. What we're seeing is that this is not a new trick. This is a continual trick. By the way, if it worked seven. Uh, uh, 3,000 years ago and it worked 2,000 years ago, will it still work today? Yeah. Absolutely. When Satan can't get a church to back down because of persecution, when he cannot get a church to back down because of government influence, when he can't get a church to back down because of the society influence, what he does is he introduces the doctrine of Balaam and has the church compromise on their doctrine so that way Jesus destroys the church himself. God brings punishment upon his people himself because it's removed the blessings and brought the cursings. This should frighten you. How is it that a church gets involved in the doctrine of Balaam. If you want to summarize what this is, it's worldliness. Worldliness. The doctrine of Balaam is worldliness. It's attack on the separation of God's people. You know what it is? Don't start a fight. You need to make yourself culturally relevant. You need to see what the people want and have that in there. You see, so many people, they think those hymns are so boring. What you need to do is spice up your music a little bit. 
You know, add a little bit of twang for those who like the country flavor. Add some more drum beats in there, some guitars, just to kind of make it sound better for those on the outside. So that way they're not so much against it. You know what you need to do? Change your message a little bit. Don't talk so much about Jesus. You know, talk more about how you need to help people out. You know, how to have your smile back. You know what? Give them some encouraging things. Don't talk about sin. I mean, sin makes them feel bad. It's going to squelch their personality if you keep pointing out their sin. You know what you need to do? Is you need to make it so that way people enjoy church. You know what? The preaching, it's not that important. Why don't we change the preaching out and let's put on a play, a drama, a cantata. What we need to do is make church more fun. And that way people aren't opposed to going to church. They'll like going to church again. That way they're not mad at your church and people like to come and nobody speaks about it. That sounds good, doesn't it? You don't want people to be mad at your church. And that's how it works. Compromise by compromise by compromise. We watch this in American churches, good churches, Bible teaching churches like us. You know what what the very first step is, is they change their music. Always stick with the old fashioned book. Yeah, that doesn't last long. The music changes and then the book changes. The messages dry up and now they're just all encouraging. You know how it starts? It doesn't start with a congregation. It starts with the youth group. That the people said, well, I just don't want my kids in there. They're just a distraction. I'm going to put my kids somewhere else. And and we want them just to enjoy themselves. And so instead of teaching the Bible, they play football or foosball. And now the kids like coming to church because they're having fun. So we're going to keep it going. And then you know what? Those kids grow up. And now they got to go sit in boring church with the adults. They don't like that. So in order to keep the kids entertained, we got to change the church so that way they could still enjoy church. A youth group is a killer. Now, I like youth groups, but it has to be run biblically. But you see, that's how it starts going. Slowly, subtly, to make people happy, not to compromise, to make it so it's more enjoyable instead of preaching God's word. And then you get to the place where they followed the way of Balaam. The error of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam. And now you've got it, so the government can't break the church down, but God has cursed the church, and he takes the sword, and he swings and destroys what is his, because it's no longer following him anymore. That should scare us. Just because the church got to the place where they didn't want people to look at them strangely anymore. They wanted people to like them and not to yell at them anymore. The doctrine of Balaam. But that's not the only thing that was wrong with the church. Notice that Jesus points out a second thing. Verse number 15. So that hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of of the Nicolaitans, which thing I've hate. Now this is the second time, and it's not going to be the last time, but the second time Jesus brought up the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And it's also the second time he says, this is a doctrine I hate. Now, if Jesus hates a doctrine, I know that's not a word you usually hear with Jesus because Jesus is love. Do you know that he has emotions and he hates things? He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now, if Jesus hates a doctrine, we should probably know something about that doctrine. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans comes from two root words. The first one is Nike, which like the tennis shoe. What is Nike the tennis shoe named after? It's the Greek word for victory. That's why Nike made it the catchphrase. Nike, victory, great, victory. Then laity carries the idea of the people. So the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is victory over the people. What it carries with the idea is that they begin to start controlling the faith of the people. See, God's intention has always been what we call the doctrine of individual soul liberty. That every person has the right and responsibility to find God's will for themselves. 
But the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is this. Listen, the people aren't looking for God's will. They need someone to tell them what to do. So I'm going to help them out and just tell them what to do. Then it moves to the place where not only I'm telling them what to do, I'm telling them don't even bother reading your Bible. Just depend upon me for your faith. And that becomes dangerous. Let me tell you, if you ever go to a different church because you move or whatnot, if the Bible, if the preacher is not constantly telling you to read your Bible, you need to be careful. Read the Bible for yourself. You have your own right and responsibility to find God's will. It is not my job as the pastor. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I have no magical powers. I could tell you what the Bible says, but all I'm doing is giving you information and you make the information decision based off the information given to you. I am not supposed to tell you what to do. <gasps> Listen, I can encourage you to read your Bible. Once all said and done, you make that decision for yourself. I can encourage you to come to church, but when it's all said and done, you read that for yourself. You can make a decision for God's will or not make a decision for God's will. But I cannot tell you what to do. Now, again, any preacher who's pastored always has folks that you wish you could make decisions for. Just do this! But it's not my job. My job is to give you the information and you make the own decision for yourself. I cannot lord over your faith. You have to decide because you have to stand before God and explain why you did it or why you didn't do it. And you can't say, well, my pastor told me to do this. He would, God's going to say, what does my Bible say? Well, I don't know what the Bible said. Well, that's your problem. No. God says, I hate the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I hate it. When people said, I'm too lazy to read my Bible. Just tell me what to do. God says, no. Now it becomes a big temptation. Because people, it takes a lot of work to find God's will. And people don't want to put in that work. Just tell me what to do. And then preachers get tired and say, well, just let me tell you what to do. Just so you do it right. But that's not how to do it. And that started to creep into this church. Those two doctrines corrupted the church and made it so the church, they were still doing things right, but they didn't know their Bible. And they were being corrupted, allowing false doctrine to come in. By the way, the protection from false doctrine is when people know the Bible for themselves. If you know your Bible, you can't be confused when someone tries to bring in false doctrine. But when you have people that don't know the Bible, it is very easy to fool them. This is a later message, but may I give you an example? Don't read your Bible. I'll tell you what to believe. By the way, Mary has magical powers. You could pray to her. Okay, I'll pray to Mary. What does the Bible say? There's one mediator between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. There is salvation in no other name but the name of Jesus. Well, if you knew your Bible, you can't be fooled by it. But if you don't know your Bible, then those things could be easily told. No wonder a certain church will get into that later. That's actually in a different message, different time frame. The Pope can never be wrong. You must listen to everything he says or you go to hell. What? What? Well, only people who don't know their Bible can be fooled by that. Do you understand? This is a doctrine that God hates. Now, remember, Jesus is there with a big broad sword. Saying, I've got some things against you. Ready to go. Listen, the, the, there's not much of a decision here. You either get right or you get the sword. And it's not surgery. It's destruction. This is a frightening message. How frightening? Let's look at the third thing. That we started looking at the Christians in the church. Then we started to look here at here the uh, false creeds in the church, the false doctrine. But then we could see the fearful crisis in the church. The fearful crisis. Notice 
what he says in verse 16. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember that sword that he's holding? He says, repent, get right, or I will come upon thee and fight against them. Now notice the pronouns there. Notice the pronouns. He says, I will come to thee as a group and fight against them. Who's the them? The false doctrine. This is not teaching that you could lose your uh, salvation, by the way. But it says that Jesus here is going to be against those that teach the false doctrine in the midst of you. Now, that's an important distinction, but still, that's going to devastate the church. Jesus said, you better repent or I'm going to start cleaning house. And the church that you're there, that local church, is going to be left devastated when I clean house. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. In fact, it goes on, verse 17. He says, he that hath an ear, remember this is a spiritual phrase Jesus said while he was on this earth. This is carrying the idea that he that hath an ear, it's a way of saying, listen to me. You got ears, use them. You ever have parents that said that? Listen to me. He's trying to put an emphasis. Listen to me. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I eat of the hidden manna and give him a white stone and a stone... Uh, a new name written within that no man knoweth except uh, saving except he receive it. Now in verse number 17 there has been entire books and commentaries written on this and all, all of them disagree with each other. Say well what does it mean? The him that overcometh that means him that repents and obeys I will give to him of hidden manna. Now people have tried to take this hidden manna that you're going to have secret knowledge and whatever else. You know what? The Bible says He's going to give us manna. That's what I believe. What does it mean? Don't clue. And will give him a white stone. In that stone a new name written that no man knoweth uh, saveth he him that receiveth it. So what's in that stone? I don't know. Neither does any of those people writing the commentaries down. They wrote in books. You could read entire thesis papers on that verse. But isn't it interesting? I want to show you something interesting. That all those commentaries spend a lot of time in verse 17 and write entire books and stuff. But they miss the big idea. What's the big idea? What's the point? Verse 16. Notice with me verse 16 and notice with me the first three words. I want everyone to take their Bible. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 16. In fact, if you're the habit of marking things in your Bible, there's many scary phrases in the Bible, frightening phrases. Let me show you one that should scare you. You should have the hair in the back of your neck standing up. Revelation 2, 16, the first three works, three, first three words, class, repent or else. Remember the picture. Jesus is standing there with a destroying sword. Saying, I've got some things against you. You've done some things well, but I've got some things against you. You need to fix this. Repent or else. You ever have your parents say, You better do this or else. And they may not finish the or else, but you know the or else is going to bring destruction. They don't have to finish that dot, 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 dot. And they're saying it, not finishing the threat because they're implying you better get this done. You do not want to find out what or else means. Repent or else. What does repent mean? Repent means a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. Practically, what does that mean? It means you better get this fixed and not just say words. It's not, I'm sorry. It means I need to get this fixed. I'm having a change of mind. I've been doing things wrong. And I mean it so much that my behavior changes. This is serious. Repent or else. Or else what? Remember, you have Jesus who's made several references here. He's holding this big destroying sword. He's looking at the church. Fix this or else. Or else what? You're looking at Jesus holding a sword. What do you think? (laughs) Or else. My wife, when I announced, most of you in here know that I prepare my sermons years in advance. uh, Series years in advance. 
My wife, when she found out that I was preaching this series years ago, became afraid, frightened. Why? Repent or else. Why? Because we've seen this series preached in churches and we have watched those churches not repent. And God pulled the candlestick of some of them. We've watched some churches hear this series and not repent. And we watched some of the most frightening things happen. We watched a congregation where all of a sudden several people, not just one, several people became physically blind permanently. Now, that's statistically not possible. Jesus takes this seriously. This is not a plaything. We've watched churches no longer in existence. We've watched people get struck with blindness. We've watched churches that all of a sudden had an abnormal amount of cancer that killed people in horrible ways. So when I announced this, my wife was frightened. Then she realized that we were putting it off and she goes, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for our church that by the time we get to this series, that our church folks have gotten to the place where they become obedient, that this message is not a frightening thing, but rather a thing that says, you know what, we're going to stay with the stuff. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to allow the error of Balaam. We're going to stay separated. We're going to keep looking at Jesus. We're going to follow after him, whatever he tells us to do. We're going to do that. You understand in that case, it's not a frightening message. It's saying we're trusting Jesus because he's the boss and we could follow after him. That's what she's been praying for for the years saying, Lord, let it be that the destroying sword doesn't hit us. But instead, we're looking at the God who controls all of the churches and saying, you're a boss. No problem. Now, when we say the church, we know that the church, local church is made up of individuals. That means each of those individuals have to make that choice. That means we as a whole need to make that choice. This isn't one where we're saying, well, the pastor can repent for us. No, this means that we as a church need to make sure that we individually as right with God as possible in this area. Are you allowing compromise? Are you ruining your biblical separation Is there something in you that says, well, I wish our church was more quote unquote fun. I wish we had better music. I wish we had better things. Now, we understand we want to always improve. We understand that. But we're talking about the era of compromise. I wish we could be more like this other church. The the people seem to really like that church. We need to be careful of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. I just wish pastor would tell me what to do. No, how about you read the Bible for yourself and find what you're supposed to do? How about that? We need to stay on the straight and narrow with the answer always keeping our eyes on the Lord. Seeing him that's high, holy, and lifted up. Again, I'm not trying to scare us because I'm bored. I'm trying to say that Jesus takes this very seriously because it's his church. And he has every right to do with what is his that he sees fit. Are we responding to him the way that we see fit? The way that he sees fit? Are we looking at him high, holy, and lifted up? He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the seven churches. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you, we hear the message loud and clear, repent or else. Lord, I thank you for allowing me to be the pastor of the Riverview Baptist Church. And over the years, watching these folks on purpose read the Bible for themselves and be concerned for themselves. And even this morning with prayer requests, people saying, Lord, I want to guard my Bible reading. I want to make sure that I'm in it for myself. Praise the Lord for that type of church. And that you would help us to always have that desire that we're reading in the Bible, that we're in the Bible, so we can look up to you for ourselves, that the pastor is just the messenger boy, that it's your church and you're able to do with what you see fit. That how we run our youth group, 
how we run our services, how we preach the Bible, what Bible we preach through. That's your decisions to make. And we just want to be obedient to you. Lord, I'm asking that you would protect us and give us grace. Lord, if there's something that needs to be adjusted, something that needs to be fixed, something that needs to be brought to you, I'm asking, Lord, that you would give us the grace and give us the courage and bravery to respond to you. Maybe there's someone in here that's fighting with their separation, that they know that they're engaged in activities, shows, programs, stuff that they know would keep them from being close to you. Lord, I'm asking that you would give them the courage and bravery to respond to you and fix that in their life so they could be in tune with you, that it could be your church and that you get accomplished what you want. Let it be all about you. Let us see you high, holy, and lifted up and respond to our Savior who loves us so very much. Lord, just like a parent threatening a child, it's not because they hate the child, it's because they love them and want them to do the right thing. Help us to respond properly and not in rebellion. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.